and welcome along to the Rugby Pod. Big Jim and Goody are here and Manscaped are helping to bring the pod to you again this week, aren't they, boys? Yes, they are, Andy Rowe and Goody. I've been using mine and that's, you know it, I've said it before, it's an absolute game changer. Uh, there's no nicking when you're trimming the old bush, get it? Because you don't want to nick it, Goody? Yeah, no, I do. Um, there's no chance of being nicked by Manscaped. Um, I actually, as you can see, I'm on holiday. I had a little trim up before I came for the missus, didn't I? Oh, let's have she, a look. She has, well, I'll do this. That's not for that's not for this video, but yeah, Manscaped, unbelievable, smoothest shave, and the smoothest feeling testicles you will ever feel. And you know what the most positive thing and ball warming thing about the whole thing is? Ninety minutes. That's for ninety minutes. Hey, <laughs> who needs to shave for ninety minutes? You've let Mate. yourself properly go, haven't you, Jim? Well, that's how long the battery lasts for, mate, so you may as well utilise it, and that's the excuse to the wife. Well, they've just launched in the UK, so check them out if you haven't done already. They're the very best in men's below-the-waist grooming, so you couldn't get a better fit for us, really. And they're offering precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Just head to manscaped.com, and you can get 20% off and free shipping with the code RUGBYPOD. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com using the code RUGBYPOD. Your balls will thank you. How have you been anyway, boys? Where are you, where are you Gertie? I'm in a different place, aren't I? You can tell. There's no dartboard behind me. There's a bit of sunshine coming in through the window. I'm in Cyprus. I'm on holiday. What? Yeah, just... Um, Last country standing. Last country standing. Well, it literally is. The, the mist and I, it started to get a bit colder in England. So back end of last week, it was like raining and about 12 degrees. And I said to the missus, I said, do you fancy going on holiday again? She's like, too right. So I had a look round. And Cyprus was the only place you don't have to um, self-isolate when you get back for two weeks. And it just happens to be 33 degrees. So we're out here on the beach, loving life. The kids are in the pool. Um, life is good, yeah. It's been, uh, it's been a really good, nice weekend so far and start to the week. How's your week, Jim? Cold. <laughs> but I'm in the garage slash studio again, as you can yeah. probably see. Um, what are you, 32? I'd say I'm borderline in six degrees. Okay, lovely. Uh, same old. Same old, mate. I just, you know what? I, now, now they've been trimmed, um, and now Manscaped has come on. I might have the bollocks, get it, the balls to go somewhere on holiday. But mate, it changes every day, so I don't know where you can go. I just keep my head down. Just keep my head down. Stay in the garage. Moan the life out of everything in here. To, mate, I'm seeing things. <laughs> mate, I, I'm in this garage. I'm seeing people now. I, I think I'm hallucinating. But mate, same old. Well, we're seeing a bit of a contrast at the moment. Jim, you're wearing a budgie smuggler's hoodie. Goody, are you wearing your budgie smugglers uh, out in Cyprus by the pool? Of course I am. I've just got Jim's face on my arse. Remember the ones that we had custom made? They're sold just... out now. They're sold out, apparently. Well, I've, 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 I kept my triple XLs and I've, I've squeezed into them. And the twins are like, no, daddy, daddy, put some shorts on. But no, the missus wants me to wear the budgie smugglers. So they are on by the pool and I'm fitting in with all the Germans. Mate, that means I'm getting a bit of profile out there as well. Is it, is it weird having my ass slapped to your... Is it weird having my head slapped to your ass day in, day out? It's a lovely feeling, Jim, having your cheeks caress my ass. Thank you. I get it. Cheek on cheek. It makes a rugby terminology as well when they're tackling cheek to cheek. Well, if you want one of those hoodies that you're wearing as well, you can uh, get them from budgiesmuggleruk.com. And there is free shipping as well. Plus, I think they're doing face masks. So get your hands on one of those so in their winter catalogue with Budgie Smuggler uk.com too late for the sale lads to be wearing the face mask we shouldn't joke about this James. Shouldn't joke. no we shouldn't no we shouldn't I won't sale what has happened there boys good before you get going on this no one's shown any concern for the lads who've gone down with it man I'm just all I'm th forget the rugby I'm thinking what are their symptoms are they ill are they on oxygen are they are they alright how serious is this for young professional athletes no one's asking everyone's just saying mate there's no rugby um which you get as well but mate it's just it's just my character mate i've just i just care for people and i also want to see how serious the situation we find ourselves in really is across the board but I, it went from 16 to 19 what i'm hearing now yeah it's 60 from what i hear it's 16 players and then three members of staff and it's you know it's been a bit let's be honest it's been the way everything's gone on it's been a complete shit show for me. Um, and you're right, Jim. No, no one's really said about the 16 players. Are they actually okay? 
what sort of level of COVID have they got? Are they any in hospital? Any news that we know? Nothing. It's all about, oh, just cancel the game or why has it been postponed? You know, it's the last round of the Premiership. And then you dig into the facts of it and understand what's happened. And it is, you know, it's pretty interesting, some of the stuff coming out. And it all goes back to, we spoke about on the pod a couple of weeks ago, so won the Premiership Rugby Cup against Quinns. And then you've got Pat Lamb coming in saying how they got 19 positive tests. They must be doing something wrong. People accuse some of the players of going out on the smash um, in Manchester. You know, Steve Diamond's denied it. There's loads of different factors that are going on. Um, and then Phil Wynn Stanley, who's the Premiership Rugby Director. From Manchester. Gone, Sorry, from, I just, I just, well, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter where he is. <laughs> People have said, you know, he used to play for sale. People have said that. But I don't, listen, I, I don't think he has made decisions because he used to play for sale. But there's a load of ambiguity around why the game wasn't forfeited like the Gloucester-Northampton game was because Northampton couldn't put a team out. Um, and understandably, as it's the last round of Premiership fixtures with so much at stake, you can see them trying to find a solution. But I don't think that solution sits particularly well across the game of rugby with you know, people talking about keeping the integrity of the competition to allow everyone to qualify for the top four. Well, the integrity of the competition, has that been... Um, what's the word I'm after here? Has that... Tarnished? Has the integrity of the competition been tarnished by the fact that some people are claiming that Sale should have just forfeited the game? Steve Diamond said he could have put a fit team out of 23... Um, I'm not sure how you can do that with the test and trace system. The RFU are investigating everything around, did they go out a night out? Well, the facts that I've been told are there was a bit of a tear up at the training ground after they've won the Premiership Cup final. So they've gone back to the training ground and had a few beers. Other people around the game are saying that there's well, That's hardly a tear up, is it, mate? If well, a, few, a few beers will tear up, mate. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? So in reality, if you're in, there, if you're in your own bubble, you win a competition... If that was me, I'd be wanting to have a few beers together as a group, either at the ground or at the training ground. You know, with the world we're living in now, you can't be going out in the smash into Manchester. I think the bars were closed anyway. But I think the question comes when you've gone back to the training ground and you've had a load of beers. Steve Diamond's denied that the boys went out into Manchester. He's been pretty clever with his words because actually he hasn't denied the fact that they went to the training ground and had a load of beers. But that's fine. But, I, don't, I don't see what yeah. the problem is with that. And Premiership Rugby actually told... Harlequins and Sale, whatever happens at that final, please be responsible at the final whistle after the game with your actions. Now, drinking at your own training ground in that bubble, not a problem at all. You celebrated, you won a cup. I don't have an issue with that. I'd expect teams to do that. I think what has become apparent is somehow there's been a, a false negative test, which has become a positive. Next thing you know, there's 19 people at the club, which I believe is 16 players and three staff that have tested positive for COVID. Steve Diamond's still saying he can put a team out. Um, all those people, how do you self-isolate those people but still put a team out in terms of if they've been in contact because they've been training together, then, you know, these are things that we're just sort of talking about now and, and dissecting with Jim's open cloth as to what has happened. What could, but we don't have all the facts around what is the test and trace system look like? What are the protocols that all the clubs have agreed to. Steve Diamond has openly gone on to BT Sport yesterday and said that they adhered to every protocol. And he's basically stated the reason the game didn't get forfeited because they could have put a match day 23 out, which would have been probably a load of the academy kids. Um, but they never... And then why it sits, and there's a lot of ambiguity around that, they didn't announce the team. There was... Um, that you know, people are then saying our oh, Premiership Rugby are bending over backwards, it's one more for one, one more for another, because obviously Northampton forfeited the game. Northampton come out and, and say whatever Phil and Stanley said on BT Sport last night was false because they wanted to uh, register other players and, and Premiership Rugby via the RFU said no, you couldn't. Phil and Stanley said that wasn't the case. So either way, there's cock ups galore going on, isn't there? You know, there's there's cross paths, there's cross referencing of different things. You know, Steve Diamond saying they didn't go out on the piss. People are saying they did. Um, how have they got 19 positive cases? You've got Pat Lamb joining the conversation saying there's something seriously gone wrong there. Why has that happened? The RFU are now investigating it. And the bottom line is, no one, like Jim said, no one's asked if those players were all right. You know, and that's ultimately the main thing. And now Alan Solomons, the Worcester coach, has come out and said, actually, 
do I want to put my club in a position where you know, we go and play against sale? How do we know how many people have, have had it, got it, without the testing process coming forward, which they will get to, but then is it still a risk that you can all of a sudden go from one positive test on a Friday to 19 positive tests a few days later? So can you imagine? Can you imagine if Worcester pull out of the game and Sale win twenty <laughs> nil? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? But Alan Solomon's has got a responsibility for the health and safety of his players, and the sensible thing, and it's it's you know this is where we're standing. Why there's so much ambiguity around it? The sensible thing for Premiership Rugby to have done would have just said, "Listen, we're you're going to have to forfeit the game because you've got so many positive test cases." Of COVID, um, I, you know, I don't, and I don't think Sale would have been that bothered. I think, obviously, they would. I think, I think they would. yeah, obviously, I, well, they would have been bothered. But what can you say? You'd be like, of course. So if well, they turn why... around, if they turn around and say you've got to forfeit the game, and the reasons are is because you've got in your squad and at nineteen, it could be more now because it seems to spread like wildfire. You can't play the game. No one, apart from apart from Sale, would be thinking this is a travesty. Everyone would be like. Well, of course, because even if you play it on Wednesday, there's still risk. And again, I'm not a doctor, albeit I probably should have been. And, com- and compared to some of the stuff that we've heard, some of the people we've seen on TV, maybe I bloody am, is you'd be worried. If you're Worcester, like you've just said then, I'd be worried as yeah, a player. 100%. So, so, you know, this is why. So, Sale don't have a leg to stand on in that sense, do they? They, 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 they don't. Especially they don't. In, the, in the, I'm going to say, I've not said it for a while. I've got everyone looking at me in the garage. Unprecedented times. <laughs> well said, Jim. Mate, so then what are they going to do? But you, you do sit there and, and, you, and you look at the reasons we're in this mess now. And the mess is, obviously, because Sale are desperate to get this game played because they know there's an opportunity to win the title, which I get. As a club, we had Simon Orange on here, great bloke. He desperately wanted to win the title. So... Their PR team, and I wrote a column about it for Rugby Pass, strong-armed, I believe, Premiership Rugby into saying, actually, we can put a team out, so the game is going ahead. And they put a statement out saying the game is going ahead as planned. And, you know, all of a sudden, it's cancelled. And then they put another statement out, so do, blaming Worcester, saying, well, Worcester didn't feel comfortable. No shit, they wouldn't feel comfortable. You've had 19 cases. So, for me, I think what Premiership Rugby should have done yeah, you've got Darren Charles, as CEO, you've got Phil Winstanley, who went on BT Sport, come out and said, as Jim has, has alluded to, these are unprecedented times. The regulations state that if you've got a number of positive cases and, um, you know, there's a risk factor, you have to forfeit the game. And you feel for Northampton because they've been pushed into a corner. They had uh, two fit front rowers where you need six. The RFU said they couldn't then... Uh, register any more players so they had to forfeit the game and that was all to do with the test and trace system by coming into close contact with all those sale players that have tested positive for COVID post that Northampton game. You mentioned Bath they threw away a pretty big lead didn't they against Ceres? Yeah I I don't know it's a difficult one because you don't know how to look at that game and we spoke about Ceres last week and the week before and the week before and we've drawn a line well I certainly have of that chapter, but there's a lot of emotion going into that game for Saracens. Obviously, Wigglesworth played his 250th game and his final game for Saracens. I think he wants to carry on. Brad Barrett leaving, obviously not been able to play, picked up a concussion in the game against Racing. Now, they mentioned it on comms, actually, and it was quite an interesting statement that they made about the emotion and the build-up to that game. Like I've been in the change room before and other teams before when players are leaving and all that kind of added emotion that takes over the week. Mate, Saracens didn't start well at all. Bath, to be fair to Bath, and we said it before, and again, only watching them again, it was the beginning of the restart of the season. They played two or three games, and their forwards looked good. My goodness me, are they physical. Yeah. Mate, they, I, I don't want to be horrible, but I'm going to say it. Mate, Billy was getting absolutely smoked. He had zero interest. I don't know if you saw, uh, he's taking the ball in the backfield. He is running at 100 miles an hour, Heads straight for his uncle, his cousin, his brother, Falatau. And Falatau puts him into next week, mate. <laughs> um, genuinely. Some hate on them. Mate, the physicality, physicality of, of Bath, I think, fair, fair play. But, mate, they blew it. Yeah, it's a difficult one because, you know, they're now sat there. It's kind of hoping 
probably that the sale game doesn't go ahead because you've now got a Worcester team that don't want to really play against a sale team. If it does go ahead, they know they've only got to win. And then that means that Bath don't make the top four. And we only spoke about them a few weeks ago, didn't we? Being the, you know, the real form side since lockdown ended and rugby resumed. Um, and now they find themselves, you know, at the whim of a game going ahead or not and a result to try and get into the top four. Um, but yeah, they're in a, a, a massive position to win it. Um, you know, and, and showed all the traits that you'd want to show against the Saracens team, which was emotionally charged. But then the Maratoji factor comes in and, you know, he's partnered with an unbelievable second row in Swinnow to, you know, get the draw and, <laughs> and deny Bath from such a strong... 17-3 up, weren't they? But then second half, they were playing into the wind. And, you know, for people watching it on TV, the wind at Allianz Park is a massive factor in the gym. Let's be honest. It blows straight down the field. It was in Saracen's favour in the second half. And sometimes, a, you know, a 14-point lead isn't enough. It clearly wasn't because it was a draw. Um, so people, you know, some people have said, oh, Bath choked. But that was still a quality Saracen's team. And, you know, when you've got the emotion that they had and the players that they've got, the second half wind, um, it, it, Bath will be very disappointed because it was in their hands. And now, ultimately, they've got to wait to see what happens on Wednesday. Goody, do you want to talk any more about Wasp's big victory over Exeter? Oh, I mean, just no, tell Feke, no, just, uh, just, <laughs> let's just talk about Feketoa's tackle meal, Willie. What wow. a hit. And Jim, Jim's a massive fan now, aren't you as well, Jim? You put it on well, Twitter. Well, mate, um, I, was a, a bit, I, mate, I was the biggest fan when I saw that selfie. But <laughs> I'll t- I tell you what, I, mate, I eat my microphone because I couldn't see it. Could not see it. I don't know what has happened to that team. Watson, we don't want to we don't want to touch too much about it, Goody. This is let me speak, and then you can speak about your beloved Wasps. Um, fair play is all I'm going to say. Is obviously a change of guard with Lee Blackett now taking the reins with Di Young. Feel a bit for Di Young because obviously his legacy. Well, no, I don't feel sorry for him. He had a great run at it. Obviously freshening up, but after the break, my goodness me, we spoke about it before. We're going to talk him up again. He scored, he got man of the match yesterday, Jimmy Gopeth. The difference he makes to that team. 43 years of age as well, Jimmy. Is. Mate, he's, he's, he's unbelievable. And then yeah. you, you ally that with bloody Selfie Fekatoa. Oh, my tackle. Because when he rocked up, I was watching some of the games and for whatever reason, it took him a while to settle in, right? It did. And It does in Coventry, right? Moon to Cov. Well, it does, mate. It does. Mate, it's, not, you know, it's the water, mate. Drinking water from the canal, mate. You don't know what you're having. What could tell you, mate? You're eating tampons and sanitary towels. That's what you're eating. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, mate, and he's, he's a phenomenon, isn't he? And as we know, again, you've got two All Blacks who notoriously All Blacks are not normally superstars when they come to the Prem. I'd go as far as saying Jimmy, Jimmy Gopeth has been. You know, he's not an All Black, though, yeah? yeah Is he not? Is he, no. should, have, should, have, should have been an All Black, then. He played for the junior All Blacks. Mate, so, that's an All Black. That's that's keep that in. Mate, it's an all black. Yeah, yeah. Mate, mate it's an all black, mate. Yeah. Mm. So, and Fekatoa, my goodness me. Uh, fair play is all I'm going to say. Well, it's, it's interesting because I've been sort of talking about this for quite some time now, Jim. It's not I'm that like, interesting. It's only interesting to you. I'm just, I'm just saying that we'll get into the top four. And you're like, no, nah, I can't see it. can't see it. Can I just give you a stat, Jim? Wasps have won 11 out of their last 12 Premiership games. And every week you're like, nah, don't see it, mate. Don't see it. Don't see it. They do. I mean, I think they do have a thank you for, um, you know, I was watching the, the Quinns game and Mike Brown obviously gets his kick charge down on the Monday night or Tuesday night or whatever. Uh, God, the knows, God knows what day it is now. But, um, you know, Jack Willis charges Mike Brown's kick down, which gets them a, the victory and the bonus point down there and they've lived on that edge in some games haven't they where they've yeah you, know, you go back to the Bath game a few weeks back in the Premiership and it was uncontested scrums they scraped through that got that victory how Bath didn't win that game we'll never know but it just shows the, the desire within the squad the attitude and what Lee Blackett's instilled in them he's just having fun enjoying it and you know I speak to some of the lads of course I do yeah, it's a, they've not changed too much rugby wise in terms of how they play since Lee Blackett took over from Die. But there's just a different energy. Um, and that's nothing against Di. It's just a new guy comes in in terms of Lee Blackett being promoted. They've changed some of their S&C staff uh, as well. And it just brings out a, a, you know, a new vibe and everyone's pushing each other harder. And, you know, home semi-final. Jim, you said we've got no chance. I remember you laughed at me at the start of the year when I said, what should we get in the top four? And we finished second. Mate, if Sarries weren't relegated, though, it would have been different. 
Well, no. If I working, know. I know. You're going to do the maths. I'm just throwing <laughs> it out there, mate. I'm just saying it. Of yeah. course. Can we talk about how bad Leicester are or not? <laughs> oh, mate, don't be mean. What do you guys make of the list of Quinn's game? Um, well, I think it's two teams that will be glad the season's finished, really. Quinn's, as we've seen, haven't performed very very well since lockdown ended and rugby came back and you know if they haven't performed very well I dread to think what people think of Leicester's performances so they'll be glad the season's over you know Steve Orpik's had a look at a load of players um, you know losing at home again to Quinns um, Isn't it mad Goody that if Saris didn't get 105 points deducted that Leicester would be relegated Yeah, yeah. Madness and I, know, and I know that it's obviously crazy that Saracens have got relegated but let's make Leicester are the biggest team in the English Premiership in terms of fans, in terms of TV views, in terms of merchandise, in terms of history. Can you imagine yeah. if they got relegated? No, it's and, they would, and they would have been. They would have been relegated. Yeah. And last year, you know, they finished 11th last year. They had to go up to Newcastle towards the back end of the season and win up there to stay in the Premiership. And they did it. And Newcastle went down. It's tough, isn't it? You know, the club is going through a massive change. Um, the one blessing in disguise for them in reality, the fact that there's no fans, and you mentioned it then, Jim, can you imagine the atmosphere at Welford Road with the way they've been playing, the, the way results are? Teams are going there and winning and getting bonus points regularly. Can you imagine the Crumby Terrace? Like, there'd be pelters left, right and centre. It wouldn't be a nice place to be at all. So, because Leicester fans are passionate about the club and the club aren't playing well. So, they've got to regroup quickly. Um, you know, I've got a feeling that they'll come back pretty strong as the season starts because it's going to be a, a weird start to next season when I don't think internationals can play for is it something like 11 out of the first 14 games or something so you're going to see a weird premiership next season and Leicester will hopefully look forward to parking this season as quickly as possible um, and will also be probably saying can you announce ring fencing as well please because we don't want to be in a relegation battle again but hey who knows they'll be glad that the season's done and dusted and Bristol are in the Premiership playoffs for just a second time ever and first time since 2007. And we can have a chat now with their fly half, Callum Sheedy. How are you, mate? Yeah, very well, thank you. Very good. Callum, thanks for coming on. Mate, we've done it. Mate, we're in, we're in the semis, haven't we? How <laughs> we? <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Mate, we saw the celebrations uh, were, they were going around social media when you found out, well, the coaches found out, some of the players found out. But a lot of work gone into it. I know it's weird with no crowds and stuff, but what a season and how happy are you and the boys? Yeah, it's obviously, um, it was weird yesterday. Like, obviously, we needed other results to go our way. Um, the cliche was we could only do our job and all that. But obviously, in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, like, oh, I wonder what's going on in the bath game or whatever. So, yeah, obviously, when we found out we were through, uh, the semis was, we were buzzing. Um, but again, it's a short turnaround. It's only a six-day turnaround. And we go against Saturday. But yeah, like you said, it's been a, a mental long season. Um, so, I'm just really chuffed that, um, we can go to the semi-final and hope you have something to play for. It's interesting, isn't it? Obviously, building into that game, you knew a bonus point win would guarantee you the semi-final spot. Uh, Max Malins drops the ball in the first half as he's over the line, and then you have to wait to about the 75th minute, I think it was, to get the bonus point try. <laughs> How much of a ribbon would he have got all of next year had that happened and it transpired <laughs> that you didn't get into the playoffs? Yeah, we probably would have sent him straight back to Saris, I think. Um, no. Mate, Sar Saris would have probably got the blame for it, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it was funny. Like, when we got the fourth try, I looked over to him and he literally was like, thank God. So, yeah, no, um, he would have taken... I'm sure he'll still take some stick. I hope it's the first thing on the review come tomorrow. I hope so. Mate, he does deserve it. He does deserve it. Uh, what's it like? I mean, there's a lot going on, as we know, in the background. and we, There's no point shying away from what we find ourselves in, in terms of not knowing what's going to happen with sale. So how are you going to prepare this week that, you know, the game might go ahead Wednesday, the podcast comes out on Tuesday. So firstly, like, you know, how are you going to prepare? Because you don't really know who you've got yet, but you kind of yeah. know, I think. Yeah, I guess it, it is strange. Um, we don't know whether it's going to be Exeter or Wasps or Sale or, you know, so um, yeah, it'd be pretty weird. I guess tomorrow will be more of a review of uh, the Irish game and we'll go through a week we need to do rather than looking at who our opposition are going to be. So, um, yeah, I guess this week will just be about us. And then come Thursday, Friday, then we, just, then we see who we're going to play and then we can uh, focus on that. Yeah, just on that, and again, this isn't to open you up and get a headline. So, and it doesn't matter to you at all. But if you were Worcester, right, and you were having to play on Wednesday, would you be happy as a player to play? And again, not looking to open you up at all. I'm just, I'm just interested to know with the testing that goes on and there's obviously a risk that you're going to be playing against players that, you know, well, there's not a risk because of the, the, 
the testing so stringent, but from a Worcester perspective, knowing the numbers that have come out of sale, would you be comfortable playing? Yeah, I guess it's, it's a pretty weird one. Like, um, it's hard for me to say until I was in that uh, position. Um, for them, it's probably frustrating now because they've got um, not much to play for, obviously, after Gloucester got five points. So, if you're a Worcester player, I guess they'd probably feel a bit, you know, cheesed off with the whole thing. Um, yeah, I suppose for them it would be weird, but then I guess they've got to trust that everything's been done, that they're going to be playing against guys who are coronavirus-free. Um, to be honest, I haven't really looked at the numbers too deeply because as soon as I take my foot, uh, my eye off the ball with Pat, I'll probably be dropped, so I can't even look at the sale numbers <laughs> because Pat's probably looking inside my head every minute. <laughs> and that's the thing I was going to ask, actually, because Pat has made a, a comment about something must have gone seriously wrong there. How stringent have the club been at, at Bristol in... You know, giving you guys advice on how to lead your lives away from the club. I know everything inside the club, you've got the new training facility, but everything is so COVID secure there that, you know, you can't really go wrong. But it's all about the behaviours outside, isn't it? Yeah, like it's, obviously Pat can't control what we do outside the club and no other, no other DOR can control what their players do outside the club. But yeah, Pat's always on to us. Um, he's like just sacrifice five, six weeks of your life, especially now we're in finals and semi-finals, And we knew we were going to be near there at the business end of the, of the season. Like it's not hard to sacrifice four or five weeks of your life. Just be a social freak and just sit at your house, whatever. Um, you know, it's not hard, really, when you think of the bigger scheme of things. Just keep in your bubble, keep with the boys, and then it's easy. Like, you, you shouldn't really catch it. But, yeah, maybe it's just one unlucky thing with, say, or maybe one of them's gone to the supermarket and called, I don't have a clue, to be honest. Um, but, yeah, as Pat just says, just be sensible, make the right decisions, and we should be okay. Mate, whatever Pat says, mate, we all listen. We all <laughs> yeah, listen. Exactly. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of this out because it's been quite a journey for yourself, but also the club. So you think about where Bristol's have been and where they are now. So in the championship, losing a couple of uh, championship playoffs, uh, you've been relegated, promoted. Uh, mate, the story of the club to kind of where it is now, you've got probably the best rugby player, rugby union player of our generation playing at your club, the new training ground, an amazing coach, the momentum's gathering, an unbelievable social media platform, which is apparently a thing with the millennials. But what, what, what's it like? You've been there, you know, for a while now and kind of seen all these changes unfold. Yeah, it's, it like, feels like a different club, to be honest. Like, um, I remember six years ago when we were, like you said, we were in the championship, we're losing playoff finals. Um, I, I was there when we lost to Worcester when Ryan Lamb kicked that last minute kick. And then the next year, um, yeah, it was just chaos. Like, and then we got, went up, come back down, and we didn't really know. We had no direction, sort of thing. And then Pat came in, obviously, and basically stripped the whole club down. Um, he came in with a vision, said he wanted to be a Champions Cup side. And obviously, like, you look at that, and we're in the Championship, and you, you would see, like, boys are thinking, like, Champions Cup, like, that's so far away. But he, he put in stepping stones, what we got to do to get there. And, you know, looking back now, we've literally lived every single one of those steps he put in place. And there was boys at the time who, probably laughed at that and those are the boys who were quickly shipped off elsewhere um, like Pat said straight away if you don't believe in it get off the bus and boys left um, boys didn't believe and he kept the boys who did believe and that's why you know slowly but surely we got rid of the boys who were at 1% of doubt and now we've got boys 100% on, on board 100% on the bus and we're, we're living the, the steps that Pat set out well, I'm on the bus and I'm sitting behind the bus driver. That's all I know. At the minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving it. What a surprise. Jim's a glory seeker. And he's <laughs> Bristol's biggest fan now, which is great because we, you know, Pat's come on the pod as well. And he was really open and honest and brilliant to have you on. And there is a big social media gathering as well um, around what Bristol are doing and other clubs are trying to follow it. How much fun do you boys have with, with that as well? I mean, you, you must sit there and you've got, since lockdown, you've saw, signed Carl Sinclair, you've had Semi Randrandra come, you're playing with Worldies in the back line as well, Pierre Tau's there. Do you look around and sometimes pinch yourself from where Bristol have come to to where you're at now? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely crazy. Like I remember when we signed Semi and I didn't know he'd signed and I remember waking up on Twitter, they said there's an announcement at 10am or something and I was like a fan, like staring at like, my iPad. And then when he signed, I was just like, Shh. like the guy's a freak. I remember like watching him in the World Cup, like literally like fanboy. And like, I was like his fanboy. And then I was thinking, I'm going to be sat in a change room next to him. I still do now, like when I'm playing with him, training with him, you're just doing something ridiculous and I'm just there like absolute freak. So yeah, um, yeah I, I do have to pinch myself like Charles Pietau, Semi Randrandra, Luke Morahan, like that back line. And then that's, that's not even mentioned your likes like Siali Pietau, Alapati Leua, Piers O'Connor, Harry Randall, Andy Rett. Like it's, yeah, it's absolutely unreal for me. 
And just a question on, on playing with Sammy then, because um, he gives me a Sammy when I watch him, but I can't say that to you, obviously. <laughs> but um, at training, do you do much bone-on-bone contact? Because, you know, you're watching Sammy play, and we're doing it from the sidelines now on TV, and he's bloody hard to tackle, right? Who wants yeah. to tackle that in training as well? That's what I need to know, because he's ridiculous. Yeah, we did. Um, we don't do much now in the games, but when it was like we were just coming back in our almost mini pre-season, just after the lockdown, we were doing like uh, six or seven V7s in quite small space. And obviously, like, I was following Semi round, like, I need to be on Semi's team, need to be on Semi's team. And if I, was nice. Semi, I was not playing against Semi. I made sure I was on a bib that wasn't playing against Semi. Um, yeah, he's, he's almost going like 30% and he's still breaking about nine tackles every minute. So, yeah, avoid Semi at all costs in training, to be honest. Mate, he's a phenomenon. He really is. I want to chat about Max Mellings and Ben Earl, but before we chat about uh, them two, What's Semi's English like? We'd love to get him on the pod. Is he is he fluent in English? Is is he um, you know, happy to to kind of get stuck in with all the banter? Yeah, hundred percent. Like him and Nate uh, Nathan Hughes, they they have a lot of Fijian conversations when it's just them two. Um, but yeah, no, he loves it. He's he's quiet, but he cracks me up. Some of his little one liners are hilarious. Yeah, we should get him on. Mate, we love uh, yeah, we love the Fijians, don't we, Goody? Obviously, the late Sarah Rambini, he was uh, a character as well. Yeah, I can imagine there's a lot of heart between Nathan Hughes and. Uh, semi round round. I can imagine there's a lot of high pitched giggling going on because oh. all of these monster monster men turn into these little children, don't they? And squeal and laugh and giggle. It's you're like, is that really come out of that monster's mouth? Nathan Hughes, honestly, he's a different breed. Like you can hear him. You're not even in the training centre. You can literally hear him. He is the loudest bloke. But you need him. Like he's a morale booster. Like as yeah. soon as you win a game, you've got the Fijian music on. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's class. Mate, they're good. Let's just chat a little bit about. Ben Earl more so than Max. I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way. To Max, he, he dropped the ball at the week and that's all we know. Why are you being horrible? <laughs> no, I don't know. I'm being horrible. Mate, talk him all he knows. I was in the academy with him. But Ben Earl's been carving up right. So firstly, what's it like? How have they been received? Because I'm sure from the outside, from some other clubs, we're like, oh, we don't want to touch any of the Saracens players for everything that's happened. But I know them two really well. They're great lads. But how have they bedded in? Have they taken any banter um, from coming over from Saracens just on loan? I, I imagine you'd be desperate to keep Keep them both, wouldn't you? Probably especially Ben Earl. Yeah, obviously they're they're both top top boys, like you just said, um, and they both fitted in really well, really quickly. I know um, they both knew quite a few of the boys from like eighth grade stuff, um, like under twenties, under eighteens, and stuff. And um, but yeah, like you said, they're they're both real good lads. Um, you obviously give them a bit of stick about salaries and all that, but um, they're, they're top class players and they've been unreal for us. Um, you know, Ben's a an absolute winner, like training game, no matter what it is. You know. He's an absolute winner and Max is one of the most skillful players I've played with. So, yeah, um, it's great to have them both on board. Um, and like you said, like, who knows what's going to happen in the future. Um, I remember we were giving Ben a bit of stick when uh, Sarri beat Leinster and he was on social media saying best day ever and all this. And we were saying, mate, you're a bear. You're a bear. <laughs> <laughs> Got up, Ben. But no, they're both top boys, to be fair. Good stuff. Well, you're obviously in sparkling form as well. You have been all year. Um, speaking to you now, I can clearly hear the Welsh twang. You've played for England against the Barbarians under Eddie Jones. And I believe also that you're Irish qualified as well via your parents. Let's, let's just get rid of all that, the, the news that's going on in the background. Who are you playing for? Because international rugby <laughs> surely is pretty close to, for you to touch it now, is it? Um, well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, obviously, it's, it's weird for me to speak about because when I watch myself back, I still think there's so much of my game to work on and stuff. So to even be spoken about in an international conversation is, you know, like I said, I got pinched myself. Um, but yeah, very proud. I'll sit on the fence and say very proud of all three. And my accent, I didn't realise, is as strong as it is until I listen to myself back and I cringe like hell. So I do apologize <laughs> for that. Um, but yeah, I'm obviously Cardiff born, Cardiff bred. Um, my mum's side's Welsh. My dad's side's Irish. And I'm Bristolian because I've lived in Bristol for eight years now. So still working on the Bristol accent. But um, Mate, yeah, don't I'll, pick that up. Stick to Welsh, mate. Don't pick the Bristol accent up. Well, sending in between would be horrible, wouldn't it? So, yeah. I'll pick <laughs> <the one. laughs> but, no, I'm very proud of all three. And, you know, to even be talked in a conversation about international honours is um, humbling, yeah. But I was going to say, if you were Scottish, you'd have 200 caps. But we've got, <laughs> uh, mate, we've, got, we've got Finn Russell, mate, so, and Adam Hastings, so we're all right. Because, I mean, the stuff around Wales, obviously, Anscombe's out. Um, he's been out for a long time with his knee. You know, Bigger's been brilliant for Northampton, but he's not going to go on forever. Um, Who's the other one? Patchell. Patchell. And obviously, yeah, so obviously Patchell as well. He's had a long-term injury. You know, this kind of happens. We saw around Lewis Rees Samet as well that you know, there was talk of Wales, England with him. With yourself, having 
put on an England shirt, as it were. It doesn't matter if you want to go back. Mate, Ross Moriarty's done it as well. So we've seen he's worse than he dies to play for England. But has Eddie Jones been in touch with any of the coaching staff? Are you allowed to share anything from that? Because look, ultimately, when you're in a winning team, which the coaches want you, right? They, the international coaches want winners. And you're in a winning team, you're in a great team, you're leading the charge. Have any of them been in contact on the phone? We spoke to um, Eddie, obviously, after the Barbarians game last year. Um, and, you know, he was, you know, keeping in touch and just making sure I was keeping on top of my skills and giving me feedback and stuff. Um, but, yeah, like, I, I spoke, obviously, this part of the season as well, with semi-finals and stuff coming up, I try not to um, get sidetracked too much. Because, like I said earlier with Pat, like, if he'll, he'll know if I'm not fully 100% focused and I'm thinking about maybe I might get an international call-up, maybe I might be in this squad. Like he would literally, he would know straight away, and I wouldn't be in the squad. So, um, yeah, obviously, squads are getting announced now. Um, fingers crossed. Hope for the best, and see what happens. I can't really comment too much because I try not to think about it. So I'm really sitting on the fence there and avoiding your question. But um, uh, that's a great yeah. fence sitting. That isn't it? I've never heard. Of, I've never heard a better one. I don't think. Love it. <laughs> I can keep going if you want, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, hey, when he's grabbing the jersey and he's grabbing. The, the leak or the letters or whatever it is on the Welsh thing, <laughs> screaming and crying. We'll know. We'll know. Yeah, we will, yeah. Andy Rowe? Uh, when, uh, when Pat pulls you up on things, when he you know, knows that your head's not in the game, like, can you give us an example of when he's done that? Has he really given you a stern talking to at any point? Thankfully, it's never happened to me. Um, but it's just like, so we'll have a meeting in the morning um, and we're in the barn, which is pretty, um, it's either cold or quite toasty and quite cosy. So it's quite easy after lunch to almost doze off um, and you know Pat will be leading his meeting and if he sees any eyes which are a bit sleepy or yawns you're, you're out or you're getting apart from Sammy apart from Sammy if he yawns it's fine yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no so like it's just little things like you're looking like your body language um, you're looking like like I said you're, you're yawning you're like do you want to be here um, so it's just like yeah like he's I think he's real keen on body language it's just like in a game if anyone's got their hands on their knees or hands on their hips like he hates it like you'll be fuming um, when we play condition games and training, hands on knees, hands on hips, you're straight down 10 burpees. So he's very much body language. Um, so I guess that's how we'll know, like, are you on it? And he looks at your body language a lot. Jeez, sound, sounds a very hard taskmaster, but, you know, he's obviously working wonders there. How good is that new training ground? Because we've seen pictures of it, we've seen the tour. Um, it must be pretty good to walk in there every day and see what the club have built. Steve Lansdowne, really impressive guy. He's putting some money into the club, isn't he? Yeah, it's honestly, it's unreal. Like, I, I've seen pictures when it was being built and like I'm sure you guys have seen pictures and you think, oh, that's good, that's good. But like when you actually step foot in there, it's unbelievable. It's got everything you could possibly ask for and um, the way they've designed it, everything gets linked. Like, so the gym is linked straight into the barn, which then got a path out to the pitch, which got a path into our recovery. Like, everything's just intertwined and linked. And yeah, it's unreal. And we haven't even had it all of it yet. Obviously, because of coronavirus, we can't have like a team room and stuff. So... Um, there's still plenty more to come there, which is, yeah, it, it's class. Um, which means now, like you said, Steve Lansdowne, Chris Boy, Pat, they've all, Mark Tainton, they've all done the work. So now there's no excuse for us not to deliver on the pitch. So, um, yeah, it's, it's exciting, but um, obviously comes with the pressures. All right, Callum, well, thank you very much for joining us, mate. And best of luck for the rest of the season, uh, especially semi-final, whoever that's going to be against, and, uh, and the Premiership. No problem. Thanks for having me. Top bloke. Top lad. Yeah. Mate, Top sp lad. spoke very well, mate. He's happy. He is. I don't know whether like, he's how, how can you not be happy? Yeah, how can you not be happy playing for Bristol's in as a ten when you got round round? If you're in any sort of trouble, semi and just chuck it to him and he'll he'll score or create something. But yeah, I mean, it sounds like a great club to be at, at the minute. We've had Pat on here. You know, you just see there's a great buzz around that place, don't you? Um, and obviously, I hope they don't win the Premiership. That sounds horrible to say because I hope Ross win it. But it would be a brilliant story for Bristol. If they can win the Premiership and the, the Challenge Cup this year, it'd be phenomenal. Do you think they pay me 150 grand to drive the bus or not? Mate, I don't reckon anyone's paid you 150 grand in your life to do anything, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> mate, on that note, mate, I've retired. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. the thing is, I was playing a bit of rugby, weren't I? I mentioned, and then obviously. Um, the, got, has that deal gone now? Well, it got a bit uncomfortable when we're negotiating money, which it always does. Hence why you don't think I'm valued at 150 grand bus drive. I might be unbelievable. Um, <laughs> but they're not allowed to play games up here. Um, Nicholas Sturgeon, aka Cranky, um, has said that there's no rugby. On. Yeah, don't get political now. No, it's just, though, with, with with Callum, um, it, it just literally they say I'm sitting on the fence and I'm you know I'm just focused on Bristol. Modern rugby, mate. Professional mate, rugby. 
He's like, come and get me. Whoever wants me, come and get me. Show he's me Welsh till he dies. He's yeah, Welsh till he dies, isn't he? I, I think he is, yeah. He's um, gone over to England. He's thought, mate, this ain't me. Yeah, it's... But it, uh, having played for England and the big carrot, you know, let's not beat around the bush. It is, it's now 17 and a half grand a game, isn't it, for England? That could be a big difference, but the heart for him surely is Welsh. Who knows? The, the, tough, just, thing is, the tough thing is, though, on that Welsh thing, Goody, is by him going to Wales almost doesn't close the door, but, you know, Bristol in two or three years' time, are they more inclined to keep him or are they yeah. more than likely trying to blood an English talent or get an, an England player? I, I don't know. And that's always the worry, isn't it? That's the worry yeah. with someone like Nick Tonkins, who's obviously gone on loads of dragons. But he signed but... a seven year, uh, six or seven-year deal with Saracens, didn't he? <laughs> Mate, so if you, if you call him Sheedy, you, you're perhaps going to Pat Lamb. I'm 100% wanting to play for Bristol, but before I get capped... Can you stick a four or five year contract on the table for me that I'll sign because I want to play for Wales? And maybe those conversations are going on, Jim, behind closed doors. Maybe they, hey, well, if, hey, we'll find out if they are, Andrew. We will. We will. Well, we mentioned Eddie Jones to Callum Sheedy just before, and he's named an England squad today without players that are in teams still involved in the Premiership playoffs. What have you guys made of it? I mean, imagine Eddie Jones hasn't coached anyone for how long now? Seven, eight months? And you know how hard he trains the boys. I just feel sorry for these guys. You just got through the Premiership restart playing about 400 games in three days. And then Eddie Jones wants a camp and there's no England game until, when is it? It's, it's the day after the Premiership final, isn't it, against the Barbars? He's going to want, he ain't going to want a pound of flesh from them. He's going to want 10 pounds of flesh. And some of these kids, they'll be absolutely buzzing. Ali Crossdale, Jack Clement, Joe Hayes, you know, some of the uncapped players. It's the biggest thing to get your first selection in England squad. I remember when I first got picked, first thing I thought was how, and then, and then I realised 12 people were injured in my position, so that's how I got picked. But then the excitement and then the reality kicks in, you're like, oh my days. Four or five days with Eddie Jones getting absolutely flogged to pieces is going to be a hard work, isn't it? But it does show you maybe the forward thinking. He's spoken about the future before. You know, Ali Crossdale's a, a really interesting one at Sarri's really really good players a northerner he's hard he's had a few injury knocks and stuff like that Fraser Dingwall as well Goody in the back yeah, Northampton mate you've rated him so maybe look uh, trying to put a positive spin on it you know Lewis Ludlow from Gloucester he's captain Gloucester he was a young pup when I was there as well called him little chief he pulled me back in training once he got the flying elbow but, um, and then he filled you in yeah I think so I think that's what <laughs> happened um, mate you mentioned Joe Hayes he's, he's a big lad tight head Mayors will give people a bit of what they want. Met the two Northampton second rows, Alex Moon, uh, Alex Moon, David Ribbons. They're Ribbons is good, eh? Ribbons mate, is good. Mate, I thought Alex Moon was, was really good last year as well. Yeah. So, mate. It's know, great got, for them, isn't it? It's yeah, great it for is. them. But, you know, I, know, I, know James... I know what you're saying, mate. Like, it ain't, they, ain't, they ain't going on holiday, mate. They ain't going yeah. there. And it's like, mate, we're going to be living life, eating great food. And, you know, we can go out for a coffee and go out for a few beers on the Wednesday night. You're getting flogged. VIP style. Yeah, you're getting flogged. Well, the Premiership is coming to a conclusion, but the new Pro 14 season got underway at the weekend. So we're going to have a chat now with our Celtic correspondent. John Cooney joins us. How are you, mate? Hello. I rushed out of training there. No kicking practice, so this better be worth it. Oh, mate. <laughs> hey. John, do not say that after what happened last time. There's an apology, mate. Yeah. Well, I mean, we had you on the podcast. We were talking up for the Lions, and we didn't want to jinx you. Yeah. But, mate... It, what happened? What happened in the last couple of games? I know you were carrying a bit of a, a knock and we don't want to go yeah. and bring the tone of the podcast down, but we know how much you love these knockout games and stuff. So let's go back a little bit. Um, how was it for you the last couple of games of the season? But I know we know the results, but for you personally. Yeah, um, I, I, I was obviously really disappointed in that final um, not to start the game and probably the worst rugby week I've had in years. Um, I said it was even, I took it even harder than not going to the World Cup, I think. And just after the couple of years I'd given, I just I felt uh, pretty disappointed not to get to start that final after what I'd done. Um, but it is what it is. I, I, it was a weird week. I had like, um, I got two messages on Instagram or Facebook. or um, One was just someone saying that they struggled with mental health issues and, and when they heard my story, um, changed their life. And I just think to get that the week that I was struggling with um, meant a lot to me. Um, and then I just got another message of a kid who passed away with cancer and, and the mum messaged me to say best of luck in the game. So that gave me massive perspective at the end of that week, which kind of snapped me out of that uh, feeling sorry for myself and kind of um, got me back to square one and now and, uh, kind of been back in the team the last few weeks. Yeah, no, you have. Um, 
well, let's just talk a little bit about that. And uh, that, that's amazing. There are a couple of messages that you've got. And I know you're a big advocate around the mental health stuff and you've, you've spoken about it before. And, and it'd be great to chat about that another time in more detail. But hand on heart, do you blame, do you blame the podcast or not? Because what normally happens, as we said before, you come on the podcast, mate, and the likelihood is, is we thought that you're going to go on to Captain the Lion. So do you blame us or not? Is, is it... Um, it's just a, a rugby thing. We'll just... on, I was worried you were going to bin me now as your correspondent. That's what I, was, <laughs> uh, I was like, maybe he gets binned. I'm going to get binned now. So that was the real concern I had. Um, but no, no, but you're, you're here for life, mate. You are here for life. I'm telling you that now. It, it just really gave me, I understand how fickle sport was. I probably understood it through injury, but um, it really kind of hit home with me how fickle it can be. Um, which Sometimes you need, um, probably better now at the start of the season. I know it's the end of the season, but uh, it gave me the opportunity now last week to kind of put a line in the sand and start again, which is something I kind of wanted to do after those couple of games. So um, I thought I went quite well the last week. So it's good now to be back to new season where I kind of start all over again. Well, that's the big thing, isn't it? Because uh, ordinarily when a season ends, you end then go on a tour with Ireland or yeah. sometimes people don't get picked and then you have longer to stew over things, don't you? But the fact that it was only three weeks, what did you get up to in those three weeks? Did you get any headspace at all? Or was it just training and trying to improve yourself to get ready to go again now? Yeah, it wasn't even, it was like, I think we had four days off and then we're back in training for Treviso. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of had a bit of a sore foot going into the Foos game. So, uh, to ride exactly where I kick at the moment. So, I kind of gave myself a week off or so to kind of rest that. Um, so, it was good to give myself a few days off and kind of forget about rugby. And it was, it was huge for me to be able to kind of restart the season and mentally, as I said, put the line in the sand and start again. And um, it's just something kind of I wanted to do after those last couple of games at the end of last year just to, kind of reset myself and go again. Because it wasn't a reflection on your performances throughout the season because probably the most important accolade well, that I ever wanted was to be named in a dream team that I hadn't named myself. And you were named in the Pro 14 Dream Team of the Year. Is that a thing? How was it? Would, like, were you quite happy to see that? I know speaking to Cockers, he weren't overly bothered, but he would say that. I know he is bothered. But was that a thing for you? Getting yeah, in that? I, I don't know if that was. Even I was lucky enough to get the Ulster play of the uh, year last week, but I was in the sauna and I come out and my mate messaged me, tell me I won and my girlfriend didn't even know. So I think everything's been kind of an anticlimax during COVID. I think um, it's just kind of taken a lot of the gloss off a lot of things. So it's obviously always nice to get small accolades like that. Um, but as, at the moment, everything kind of feels a bit different. So obviously the season starts again. Um, it was great to see some fans back in the stadium, 600 fans. But how weird was it to have 600 fans in the stadium when... You know, you're used to those stadiums being absolutely rampacked. Yeah, it, it is, but it actually still makes a massive difference. Um, I, I think I completely undervalued. Um, obviously, I knew fans are unbelievably important, but I thought playing games without fans is still going to be uh, reasonably fun, and it, it's pretty crap, to be honest. Um, I thought because you train like that every day, it would be easy to get up for it and stuff, but it, it definitely did feel a lot different. And you look at the football as well, it's not the same really watching, but... Um, even having 600 people the other day, it, I don't know, for some reason, it makes a little bit difference um, in terms of the atmosphere. And, and even getting there, it feels more like a home game. Even to play in the Kingspan where we train every day and stuff makes a big difference. Whereas in the Viva, um, sometimes even the home games felt like away games. So it was just nice being back in an environment that you're used to. Uh, some more positive news. Oh, well, it, it might not be. Um, it might be. I, I kind of gone back and forth a little bit on it around the, the restructure of the league. And again, I keep using this word unprecedented, but it is. We don't really know what's happening. Uh, the Southern Kings and the Cheetahs uh, don't seem to be coming back into the comp, but there's talk of the other franchises in South Africa, basically the big ones with Sia Khaleesi coming in. Um, from a player's perspective, it's going to add more travel, but do you think it's going to add a little bit more profile to the league, having some the superstar players, uh, Peter Steph the Toy, Sia Khaleesi, Ma Pimpy as well, coming back, back up at some point. I mean... Surely it's going to add to the profile, but how is it going to be as a player with that travel? Or are you going to be excited to play against some top teams down in South Africa? Yeah, I think it'll be fun. Even having the Cheetahs and, and Southern Kings the last couple of years, uh, it's probably some of my favourite weeks with those two weeks last year. We got to stay in Cape Town and stuff like that. So I think it, it is something to look forward to when we live in this rubbish climate that every now and again you might get to go there in September, or even sometimes in December. So it, I've enjoyed it. And they're obviously massive men and, People like Sia Khaleesi seems to be the nicest lad ever. He's, he, he, he's been messaging me the odd time on Instagram. He seems like such a nice fella. So it'd be nice to play these type of people you get to watch. Obviously, they won the World Cup. So um, it would be good to play them. And I think it would be coming out of those games a little bit sore. Um, so it'd be good to have them involved. Well, obviously, looking at the Pro 14 this year, it's going to be weird 
in reality, there's 12 teams in it at the minute. Um, what have you set goals wise for, for you personally and also for the team? Are you, are you looking to say, we've just got to go one further and win it? Um, and yourself with the goals that you've personally set yourself? Yeah, I, I, I do think we massively underperformed and I think we got lucky to make that final, obviously. And then in the final, we didn't really, um, we shot a sh shot at the first 20 minutes, but I think we kind of um, got completely dominated. So for us, I do think it's it's kind of playing a bit more like our own game. And I think we did a bit more against Treviso. It's probably the best rugby in the first 40 minutes anyway we've played um, in the last six, seven weeks. So I think it's important with a lot of young players coming through that now we've blood a few of them. It was, it was good to see some young lads playing last week. Um, because you, you see with Leinster with 40, 45 people playing throughout the season and, and, and they go on and win the league. So I think it's important that we, we get those players playing a bit more often and, and keep playing our brand of rugby because we were playing really well before uh, lockdown and, and as I said, we didn't play as well after it. So I don't think it really helped us as a team. But I think yeah, getting back to those finals and even getting a bit of a taste for it is going to be a big difference um, if we ever do get to there again. Because everyone's talking about Leicester, aren't they, Coons? Like they're talking about how good they are, the kind of squad depth, you know, 45, 53 players that they used last season. And the big question is, is why and how are they so good? And again, this is something that's probably going to be spoken about, I think, after this season as well and going forward around the, um, the salary cap in the Pro 14 or the Pro 16 or whatever it turns into. But why are Leinster so good? And Dan McFarlane's talk about trying to bridge that gap every time Ulster get better or, you know, Ospreys are better this season is Leinster just get better. Like, how do you try and bridge, bridge that gap with a team that have got such quality in their, in, in yeah. their squad? Yeah, that is the tough thing. And I, I do think a lot of it is to, to see our younger players getting more game time and even players who aren't young but haven't played enough. And um, it's good to see, like I said last week, Stu Moore playing at 12 and James Hume. They're two young centres getting game time and, and Dave McCann coming on us a uh, back row. And, these are players who probably in the past we couldn't afford to give game time, seeing as we, we kind of needed every single point we could get. But um, maybe with this season, we might, we might be able to blood a few more of them and, and probably gain more trust in these players that when they get to these bigger games, they're, they're going to perform and they're used to playing. Because uh, we all know what it's like when you get your first few games in professional rugby. It takes quite a while. I was hauled off at halftime in my first ever game. Um, I'll never forget that. So I think it, it takes a while for us all to learn, kind of get used to the game. All right, John, well, thank you very much for joining us. Best of luck getting into that squad uh, for yeah. the Six Nations and the Autumn Internationals and uh, best of luck for the rest of the Guinness Pro 14. Thank you very much. Great bloke. Good lad. Yeah, Good top, lad. Top bloke. Hey, you know what? And I, Just going back to his point, and I didn't want to make light of him getting dropped or whatever happened, the situation around him in the semi-final and the final last year. Semi-final, he got taken off at half-time against Edinburgh and then he didn't. He was on the bench for the final and everyone thought he was going to play because he deserved uh, the right to do that. But I thought it was best to ask about that because, man, I felt bad. I was like, is it two of the podcast? Was he carrying a bit of a, a niggle? But, mate, he's an honest man, isn't he? Like, yeah, he, he, is. he, mate, he says it how it is and I love that because, mate, you'd be fucking raging. You know what I mean? You'd be gutted yeah. if, you, if you, you know, player... Player of the, um, the season at the club, named in the in the Pro 14 Dream Team. I don't care what anyone says, that's a, a massive thing. So it was great that he opened up a little bit about that and we wish him well for the season, hopefully the Ireland score as well. And it's interesting, isn't it? You know, we uh, Everyone gets messages on Instagram, on Twitter and, and various different things coming in. But those couple of messages that he got that he's happy to talk about, he said he was in a dark place. And it's amazing the impact that one little message that you send to someone can have, you know, a real bearing, a real lift on your own energy. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the couple of messages he got around, um, you know, other people going through dark times and having a you know, tough moments kind of spurred him to think, actually, you know, I need to make myself feel a bit better here and, and you know, step up. And it's great to see how positive he always is. And how positive his lid is. I mean, I mean his lid is lush. But this never out of place. He, he cannot veer away. He, he can't, wait for it to get to a number three or four, can he? He's, it's either Bick or one, that's it. But there, ain't, there ain't no more. There ain't yeah. no more. He's every week without fail down at the Barbers. No, we love Coombs. He's our Pro 14 correspondent. Poor KB. Poor, poor KB. Well, you sat KB. You wanted Cooney, so there we go. <laughs> Mate, I love KB. Well, we can get into some more rugby in a minute, but it's time for your favourite feature now, isn't it, Jim? I've said before, Andy Rowe, it's not my favourite feature. It's the Millions' favourite feature. So, it's called Jim Will Solve It for the Millions of you who've never heard it before because we get an extra million every week. Riddle me this, lads. Riddle me that, Carol. How you doing? Jim will solve it. Oh, yes, I will. Hit me! 
this could actually require a calculator. Jim. Oh my God. All right. Well, I've got one on my phone. Because, <laughs> because obviously you've had nice people on rather than me and nice riddles and theirs might be based on something else, but you know, I'm the, the numbers addict. Right. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. About the numbers. Yeah. Right. Numbers. So, okay. So you're allowed to use your calculator for this one. Okay. Hit me. So, what do you get? But but I'm going to give you a countdown on this. I'm going to give you ten seconds for the answer. Oh. Oh really? Oh. What do you think, Andy? I, I think maybe twenty seconds. Twenty seconds then. Okay. What is the answer if you know on your um phone and it's got all the numbers on it and if you multiply all those numbers so you go like one times two times three times four and so on all the numbers on your phone pad what's the answer jim start the clock and say oh no no one times two one times two what the one times three one times two every number jim Every thing, like multiplied together. What's the answer, Jim? I only got I got seventy eight. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jim, the question is, what number do you get when you multiply all of the numbers on your telephone's number pad? Yeah, and you got seventy eight. Oh. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what happened. <laughs> is it as simple as saying? About it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. If you How multi- many numbers have you got on there? Ah, one, two, one, two three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And what? Oh, are you sure? At the other number. Ten with a zero. Ten. Yeah. 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 And if you multiply them all. Yeah, yeah. What number do you get? So you got your way through it. No, Hundred. So, so you got zero times one. Yeah. Times two. Yeah. And then times, times three, three. Times four times five, times six, times seven, times eight, times nine. What do you get, Jim? <laughs> 89. <laughs> is it? Is it? Have we got it? Have we got it? No. no but I love you anyway. Oh, oh my <laughs> word. I thought I've got it. I'm trying to work out my nine time table. My goodness me. Genuinely, I feel awful because people think that I'm taking the piss and like, we're putting it off. Under pressure, okay. Carol Vaughan, the, the numbers lady of the world, as I'm under, I can't work, how do I work that out? How do I work okay. that out? It's just, quite just, simple. So start at the start. So if you write them all out, zero well, times know. one. Okay. Yeah. What is that equal? One. <laughs> zero, 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 zero. Okay. Zero so times what's... two. Zero. Yes. Yes. <laughs> My goodness me. Times two, times three, times four, times five, I don't know, times nine. And the answer is, Jim? Banter. The answer is banter. Zero. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Hence why the number came up. My goodness uh, me. Well done. You know, what I'm going to do, so the millions of people out there, Carol, don't think I'm stupid. I'm going to have to go away and look into all these different kind of number riddles because that one got me, but no, I still solved it. That. That's called cheating. You can't I would never do that. I would never ever do that. that. Are, are, are you still big in India, by the way? We, um, we, we are we. massive. We are mm. we still big in India. I think we, we dropped off, Carol, I'll be honest, since you've not been on the, the show the last couple of weeks. Um, Brazil, no, yeah. hey, no innuendo intended. We are big in Brazil as well, apparently. <laughs> so I don't know how. The Brazilians. Yes, they, they, they like us there, but India's the big market for us because that's the masses, as we know. As we know. Well, Brazil's got... Brazil's big. Is. Yeah, but, not, but apparently India, big India's India. big, not as big as yeah. India, so... Okay, all right then, so that's the aim, to be big in Mumbai. Well done, Jim, you got there in the end. Yeah, questionably. It's Carol, she's just... <laughs> she's the numbers lady of the world, and... Um, I had Bisco's math teacher. My favourite bit was Jim, what's zero times one? One. Uh, I, I said one. Happens. Yeah, you did. I, I, I thought she said plus, I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> like, it's a pressure because I know the answer to that. That's the thing. Anyway, Do lads. You? Anyway, lads. Riddle me this, lads. Riddle me that. I'll put my hands up and tie behind my back with my feet and my legs and my ankles. I didn't solve it that time. Hey. Forget it. 
Bonjour. Thanks, Goody. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Producer Tim. Thank you very much for listening as well. Don't forget to hit subscribe on whatever platform you get your podcasts on and check us out on YouTube as well. Robbie Pod, lads and girls. Pod, pod, pod. <laughs>